Thank you, Eric, for leading us in worship. I love those two songs together. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, this is the day that you have made. Help us to rejoice. Help us to rejoice and be glad in it. And I'll help you be glad in it. I'm going to ask two people to stand right now. Bill and Carolyn Overway. Would you stand? This is their 70th wedding anniversary. Woo! <laughs> Congratulations, you two. And the really neat thing about your life, you have been to us the path to Jesus Christ in all you do. May you have another 70. <laughs> Beautiful. Let's us make it to 70. Okay. Okay. 58 is coming. That's yeah. right now about all I can handle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what else to be glad in? We are glad that this morning the youth Oregon mission trip returns. We thank God. This is Father's Day. We thank God for fathers. We thank God for our Heavenly Father who guides us with his gentle hands. <laughs> and Lord, remind us of the privileges that we enjoy as your people. To come to you in these moments. To confess our sins. To receive forgiveness and to give it. To pray, to sing, and to listen. To renew our fainting spirits. And to rest in all of your promises. Open our eyes to see you, Lord. Open our ears to hear your word. Visit us through your Holy Spirit this morning. And help us to celebrate our faith corporately. In your name, Jesus, amen. Now, let's continue that celebration. I want you to stand, be daring, step out, one, two, three steps, find somebody you don't know all that well or at all, and make them feel welcome. This, I know, we kind of trick you every, every Sunday. Bill and Carol, we do have flowers for you, okay? These are yours. You'll have to come pick them up at the end of the service. Friends, we're so glad to see you. We're so glad you are here. If you are new to Christ Memorial, um, you'll find in the back there are little slips of paper like this. Please fill them out. We'd like to get to know you better. Also in the back, if you want to join in, with us in what we get to do and have the privilege of doing in the community. If you want to give of your resources, we also have some baskets in the back. You can also do that online. But we're so glad you're here this morning. As John said, it's Father's Day, and we want to acknowledge that it's Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. But we also want to acknowledge that this can be a complicated day. 
We can celebrate fathers, but friends, it can also be a hard day for some. Some who have lost their fathers, or for some who, who have wanted to be a dad, but maybe for some reason or for some circumstance can't be a dad. And so it's our prayer today that, that for all of you, that you will feel God's shalom, that you'll feel God's peace today. I wanna to thank the Brights for starting us off. Um, you wanna hear a little story? So, so <laughs> when, I, when, when I came, to Christ Memorial um, a few months ago now. We didn't, we didn't know each other very well. But this is how cool this is. Because yesterday, they celebrated a wedding of their grandson, and their son's name is Paul. I'm gonna get a little teary-eyed. Paul was my counselor at Camp Geneva. And it's in cabin four under Paul's loving direction that I made a decision to follow Jesus. So, I can still picture it. Paul Bright, my counselor, Camp Geneva, cabin four. So, thank you guys for doing that. I want to invite Miss Rachel to come up. So some of you know Rachel, some of you may not know Rachel. We are so grateful here at Christ Memorial Church to have Rachel as our children's pastor, our children's director, and so she looks after our kids. And so on a Sunday morning, she's all over the place making sure our kids are in the right place. But we are so excited because what's happening this week, Rachel? I'm getting married this coming Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> So Rachel is getting married, and this is her fiance, Wyatt. And Wyatt couldn't be here with us today because he had to work this morning. Um, but we are so excited for you, um, and it's going to be an amazing experience, and um, we would like to pray for you. Is that all right? Okay, friends, so if, if you can maybe extend a hand or, or pray, we just want to bless uh, Rachel and Wyatt in their, in their marriage. So let's pray. God of the universe... Blessed are you for the gift of marriage. Blessed are you, O oh God, for Rachel and for Wyatt. And Lord, we thank you so much that, that Rachel loves our kids so well. And we are grateful for that. But Lord, we, we pray for Rachel and Wyatt as, as they get married and as they prepare and take steps. They've been preparing for a long time, but Lord, we are within a week, and, and sometimes it can get chaotic and stressful, and, and, but Lord, we ask that you give them your peace as they look forward um, to getting married, and not that they look forward to the wedding, but they look forward to the marriage and the years afterwards. How cool is it that we get an example of a, of a couple being married 70 years, and then we get to celebrate Rachel, who just is beginning this journey. Lord, we pray for them. We pray for especially Wyatt, who um, gets nervous in front of crowds. Um, we ask that you um, give him um, a spirit of calmness um, and that you just bless their day in every single way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. This morning, we have an awesome opportunity. And it's an awesome opportunity to be led in worship. And this week, something amazing happened here in Holland on the, on the campus of Hope College. It's called The Awakening, and it's, it's a camp. It's a, it's a place for high schoolers to learn about worship and to learn about their calling into ministry, whatever that is, what, whether that's going to be a nurse, whether it's going to be a teacher, whether it's going to be a mom, a dad, or whether it's going to be a worship leader or a pastor, they learn what it means to follow God's call and to step into God's presence. And so I want to invite Alex and Emma to come up, and we can just come, come right to the front here. We'd... All right. I want you guys, many of you guys know Alex. Alex plays the piano for us every Sunday. And then Emma dances for us. And Emma has been a member here for a long, long time. So we've been able to see her grow up. Um, but I want you guys to share with us a little bit, what is The Awakening? Sure. I said to Eric, you know, three 
years I've been here, they never let me get up front with a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to go sit down. <laughs> this is a great opportunity to do my first time really in front of all of you speaking about Awakening. So Awakening is a, a week-long camp at Allen College for high school students that are gifted in the arts. And it's an opportunity to train them in planning and executing a worship service. So um, throughout the week, students take classes in their area, whether that's piano, organ, technology, dance, art, guitar, drums. Anything you could possibly see in a church service on a Sunday morning, um, preaching as well. Um, but on top of that, there's also a lot of deep um, spiritual growth and learning and meditation. So we follow a prayer practice throughout the week. Um, and then on Thursday, we have our festival of worship. So the students are paired into small groups, and those small groups are organized as if it's a worship band. And so each group leads a short 15-minute worship service to kind of as the culmination of our week. So there are a lot of other special events that go on. Um, and then uh, I'll have Emma talk a little bit about what it's like to be a college intern or a small group leader. And then I'll talk a little bit about what our theme verse and our theme for the week were. Yeah, so there's about eight of us that were interns and two of us are assigned to about seven or eight students. And we get to every night um, worship with them and practice our set of worship that we um, put all together and it's this one big festival of just worship and we have some preachers and dance and it's absolutely beautiful the way that they come together and sometimes rehearsals go way much later than we want them to but these kids just love to worship and it's really beautiful to see. Cool. So Alex, why don't you tell us a little bit about the theme of the week and what you guys studied. Yeah, so every, every year at Awakening, this is our eighth year doing Awakening, and um, every year there's a theme verse. So our verse this year came from Philippians 4. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Hmm. And we thought that verse is really appropriate for high school students, but that verse is really appropriate for us here at Christ Memorial too. So I'm excited to have our awakening students. They'll come up on stage and um, lead us in worship. Our theme for this week was Tune My Heart. Um, which we know comes from the familiar hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. So if you could stand and join us in worship, we'll get started. Thanks, Emma.
In fact, your word says that there is nothing, nothing that can separate us from your love. There's nothing that we can do. There's, there's, we, there's just nothing, Lord, that can separate us from your love. Help us to remember that. Help us to remember not only that you love us, but you love every person no matter what. And because you love them, Lord, help us to love everyone too. Even sometimes when it's scary. But God, that's your call. Because you first loved us, we can now love one another. God, we thank you for this time as a family We thank you for this time that we can be together, that we can sing praises to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may have a seat. I want to invite the kids to come forward.
All right, come on, come on forward, guys. Here at Christ Memorial, we, we value our little ones, not so little ones, as they grow up. And we also value that we get the opportunity, come on forward, guys, that we get the opportunity to bless them. And then they get to bless you in return. Okay? So what we do is we say as a congregation, may the Lord bless you, and then the kids will repeat and bless you. Okay? And then we say, may the Lord keep you and may the Lord give you peace. It goes like this. Ready? So congregation, here we go. May the Lord bless you. Okay, wait a second, wait a second. Just come on, come on, guys. You want to make sure you get up here? All right. Shall we try it again? Let's try it again. Ready? Here we go. May the Lord bless you. You guys ready? Here we go. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord give you peace. May the Lord give you peace. All right. Good job, guys. Now you can follow Miss Rachel. Get your hard hats on. We wear hard hats when we go to worship in wonder because we go through a construction site. So make sure you get your hard hat on. All right. You guys want to come up and lead us in prayer? Yeah, why don't you guys come on right up here? All right, good job, guys. Pray with us. Most gracious and merciful God, we confess to you and to one another that time after time, we enter your presence with countless pray prayers, but with hearts that have been closed to your grace. We lift our hands to you in praise, but our feet can still walk in ways of evil. We have rehearsed your commandments, but have refused to see your face in the needs of our neighbors. We intercede, Lord, for those grieving, for Eric and Angela Woltheis and their family at the passing of her father, Karen Watson at the passing of her husband, David, and Becky Rusher, whose husband, Alan, completed his earthly journey just this past Friday night, mm -hmm. entering heaven. For health concerns, we intercede for Shirley Scott, Micah Stout, and Jean Quanstrom for your healing in their lives. And Lord, we pray that you forgive our lack of faith and pardon our acts of injustice. Grant us the healing that comes from your presence and the cleansing of your all-powerful word through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, God. Stand and sing with us.
Well, a big thank you to, to each of you for, for leading us in worship today. Thank you for taking the time to share your gifts with us as we all praise God together this morning. The verse that comes to mind is one generation will commend your works to another, right? Yeah. Sorry, I'm just getting situated here. <laughs> here we go. All right, friends, so confession time. Confession time. A couple weeks back, our girls, they were learning about the fruit of the Spirit at school. Uh, you know, it was Pentecost recently. And, and so they learned this song. They came home singing this song about all the different fruit of the Spirit. And, and it was so cute. It was so adorable at first, right? One of those proud dad moments, but, but it didn't last long. It didn't last long because, because the song was super cute the first time I heard it, <laughs> but it was less and less cute when they kept singing it all the time. And sometimes we're so excited they were even screaming the words. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm all about the fruit of the Spirit. I'm all about kids learning and memorizing and internalizing what the fruit of the Spirit are, but I'm not a big fan of hearing the same song over and over and over again. And so needless to say, I was annoyed. I was annoyed, and that was kind of convicting because, you know, here our girls were, and they were, they were singing about things like patience and, and <laughs> kindness and and gentleness, and, and I wasn't exhibiting those spiritual fruit all too well, especially after about the 50th repeat. And so I realized, you know, I could use a little reminder on gentleness, and, and so I figured, you know, I probably can't be the only one, right? Uh, maybe I am, and if so, you're just going to have to put up with it. You're going to have to be a little gentle with me this morning. But, but we're talking about gentleness today. God's word, it comes to us from the book of Isaiah. We're going to be reading Isaiah 40, verses 10 to 15. And, and let me give you just a little background to this passage. Okay, God's people, the Israelites, they've been living in exile in Babylon, and God is now coming to rescue them. And, and in our passage this morning, God shows the Israelites not only how strong he is as he comes to rescue them, but also how incredibly gentle he is towards them also. We see God's gentle caring for his people, the Israelites. And, and as we're going to see, the gentleness that God shows to his people back then is the same gentleness he calls each of us to live by today. And so follow along as we read God's word together this morning. Isaiah 40, beginning at verse 10. Hear now the word of the Lord. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or with the breath of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who has understood the mind of the Lord or instructed him as his counselor? Whom did the Lord, I think I'm off on one, right? Yeah. Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him and who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, you know, when you look at a person's hands, when you really look at them, you can learn a lot about that individual. Uh, just take a minute, look down at your own hands, right? Take a minute, look down at them, go on. What do you see? What do your hands tell you? You know, when I look at my hands, I, I see some scars from, from when I used to work construction. Um, I, I see a callus under my wedding ring band that's been there ever since I've gotten married. I, I, I see uh, some, let's see, I got some ink stains from the pen I was using this morning. 
And if I look extra closely, there's a big scar on my thumb here. And that was from a time actually at our last house when one of our daughters, we still don't know which one, managed to, to clog the upstairs toilet with a toy. We never found the toy, but we're sure that's what it was. And, and so I was trying to, to snake the drain through the toilet there, and, and I was working a little too vigorously. My hands weren't gentle enough, and I broke the handle on the snake and sliced my thumb open. Tells a story, right? Yeah. So what about you? Look at your hands Do they tell you a story? Like I said, there's a lot we can learn about a person just by looking at their hands. And in fact, one of my favorite pairs of hands, they belong to someone who's not alive anymore, but they belong to a man named Andre Rene Rusimov. But you may know him better as Andre the Giant. Andre the Giant, because Andre was huge. You probably picked up on that from his name, but this man, he was over seven feet tall and he weighed over 500 pounds. But if you ask me, one of the most impressive features of him was his hands. His hands were enormous. I I think I have a picture. With just the palm of his hand, he could cover a person's face, right? Right? There's pictures of him holding a can of pop and it looks like a little juice box in his hand. And I learned this this past week, his rings were so big that you could take a half dollar coin and pass it right through the middle. He was huge. He had incredibly strong hands. There's even stories of Andre uh, picking up the side of his friend's car and turning it sideways as a bit of a practical joke because, you know, apparently that's what you do. I'm sure if we could look at Andre's, Andre's hands today, they would tell quite a story. And you know, in our passage this morning, God's word to us, we find another story. And it's not about us and our hands, but it's about God and his hands. God's word to us today gives us just a glimpse of who God is and how powerful he is. And it does so by having us take a close look at his hands Because remember, this passage speaks to a time when the Israelites, they were in captivity and they started to doubt God's strength. You see, they were living in exile in Babylon and like we said, they needed to be rescued. But after they had lived there for so long, the people started to wonder if God was really strong enough to save them or if maybe he had just been overpowered by all the Babylonian gods. And so God, in his response, he sends the prophet Isaiah to tell the people that he's coming to rescue them. Verse 10, see, the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. And in the Hebrew language, they're really painting this picture of God as this mighty warrior who's coming to rescue them. But then, because the people are doubting if God's strong enough to save them, he goes on to show them how strong he is, and he does so by telling them to look right at his hands and to see the story that God's hands tell. Verse 12, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or, or with the breath of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or, or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? And it's a rhetorical question, right? The answer is God. It's like God saying, you think I'm not strong enough to save you? You're wondering that? You're doubting that? Just look at my hands. Right, I can scoop up all the oceans and and carry them right here. I can measure the sky, the heavens, from just my thumb to my pinky, the breath of my hand. I can hold all the soil, all the earth of this world as if it's in a little basket. And, And with just two of my fingers, I pluck up mountains and I set them on the scales. And if that's how strong my hands are, then verse 15 Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They're regarded as dust on the scales. In other words, you think those Babylonians are going to be a problem for me? They're insignificant. They're nothing. A a single drop in a giant bucket, a speck of dust that I just blow right off the scale. Don't be afraid. 
just look at how strong my hands are and know that there is nothing that can get in the way of me rescuing you. And in fact, when we study these verses a little more closely, God's message is even more powerful because, you know, when God talks about these things like the ocean, the the sky, the mountains, the hills, and so forth, what God's doing is he's comparing himself to all the gods of the surrounding nations because back then people, they worshiped these various things as gods. Uh, There was a god of the sea. Its name was Yam. There were also gods of the sky, of the earth, of the mountains, of the hills, And so when the Israelites were captured by the surrounding nations, it it made sense that they would have started to think that that they had now fallen into the hands of some other gods, which would be terrifying if you believed in that. Except God, the real God, the only God, he says to the Israelites, listen, you're not in their hands. No, you're in my hands. What can the God of the sea possibly do to you? I carry the sea. What can the God of the sky do to you with just one hand? I can cover it in darkness forever. Friends, it's amazing. God is incredibly powerful. He's incredibly strong. I mean, just think about it. That's the kind of God who's watching over us in whatever we're going through in our individual lives. That big and mighty God is the one who's become our loving, heavenly Father. You know, we like that about God, don't we? We like his strength. We like his power because we want someone like that looking out for us. We want a God who's stronger than anything we're facing. Just like the Israelites, we don't want someone with weak hands. No, we want those Andre the Giant-sized hands. It's kind of like those old garbage bag commercials, right? We don't want wimpy, wimpy, wimpy. No, we want hefty, hefty, hefty. (laughs) First time I ever compared God in that way. Maybe that's not the (laughs) best. I'm just thinking of that right now. Sorry. (laughs) But then our passage does something really unique. And it paints sort of this kind of contradiction. Okay, because, because it, it doesn't just say God is strong, but it also says he's gentle. And I don't know about you, but you know, normally when I think of strength and gentleness, they don't seem very compatible, right? They seem almost like opposites. Like you can be either strong or gentle, but you can't be both, at least not at the same time, right? And sometimes we want a gentle person, like when we're hurt or we're sick or we're need, we need comforting, but, but other times we want a strong person, like, like when we need rescuing or when we're in danger. But again, picture a strong person and picture a gentle person, and I'm guessing you're picturing two very different people, maybe Arnold Schwarzenegger or, or Mr. Rogers, Right? what's so cool about our passage today is it talks about God as being both strong and gentle. And again, we see it through the way God uses his hands. Because we don't just see God's strong hands, we also see his gentle hands. Verse 11, remember everything we've talked about now about God and his hands. And this is what else it says about God. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs right in his arms. He carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Friends, just think about that for a moment. God gathers all of us, all of his little lambs in his arms. He he takes his hands, right? The same hands that are bigger than the sky itself. And now with those hands, he, he hugs us. He holds us. He protects us. He comforts us when we're afraid. He he soothes us when we get hurt. God carries us close to his heart. He, He takes his hands, the same hands that are big enough to hold all the oceans at once, the same hands that are strong enough to carry the entire world. He takes those same hands and he gently carries us like little babies like little Oakley that we saw baptized last week. 
He doesn't drop us, he doesn't crush us, but he loves us. And God gently leads us. He, he takes those same hands that can pick up mountains with, with just two fingers and he reaches down to hold our hands. He invites us to, to cling to his finger, right? As he leads us safely through our lives, kind of like a daddy helping his little daughter cross the street. And it's really because of God's gentle nature that we don't have to be afraid of him no matter how strong he is, because we know that even when we mess up, God doesn't let us go. He never even clenches his fist in anger because any anger he might otherwise have deservedly had towards us, it's already been fully paid for in Jesus. How do we know this? How can we be so certain? You probably don't need me to tell you, but all we have to do is look at another pair of hands, right? Jesus' hands. Because the scars on his hands, they show the depth of God's love for us. And so we know that God's gonna keep on gently holding us forever. And that right there, friends, really gets at what gentleness is all about. Because you see, gentleness isn't weakness, like we sometimes are tempted to think. It's actually the opposite. Gentleness is power under control. I'll say that again. Gentleness is power under control. It's actually interesting uh, when they talk in the, in the ancient times about these great war horses, right? That, that military generals, they'd ride, charge into battle on, right? A massively impressive, strong creatures. They describe them as gentle. Why is that? It's because for as strong as they were, that strength was harnessed. It was under strict control. Gentleness is power under control. In fact, it takes a whole lot of strength to be gentle. And again, just look at our passage. God, he talks about how he knows all different things, right? Everything. Verses 13 and 14, who has understood the mind of the Lord or instructed him as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? Who was it that taught him knowledge or, or showed him the path of understanding? And again, it's rhetorical, right? No one taught God these things. God knows all these things. He did since the beginning, since even before the beginning. So again, just think about that with me for just a moment. God knows all things, far more than any of us do, right? So can you imagine how frustrating that would have to be, right? Having people like us, we all do it, you know, question God, disagree with him. You know, we think we know better. He made us, he made this world. We all do it. How much patience it must take to put up with us, still messing up each day, right? We still not getting it still falling short of God's standards. But, but how does God respond to us as his children? He doesn't write us off. He doesn't get sarcastic with us. He doesn't roll his eyes at us. He doesn't yell at us. He doesn't yank us forward at some pace that we can't handle. He doesn't just let go and leave us behind. No, he's gentle. He walks with us. He gently warns us about the bumps on the road. He, he patiently reteaches us things that he's already taught us over and over and over. And convicting for me, he listens intently to our prayers, even the ones we've whispered in his ears for the hundredth time. He never grows tired of it. God has all the power in the world, but he holds it in check. And because we're his children, he only uses it towards us in ways that encourage and strengthen and comfort and grow us. How cool is that? And friends, God calls each of us to be gentle as well. Not to be weak, no, but to take whatever strength he's given us and to harness it always towards his good purposes. 
You see, the difference for us is that, is that gentleness, it doesn't mean putting our strength under our control. It ultimately means putting our strength under God's control. You see, strength, true strength, means choosing to respond gently all the time, but especially, especially during those moments when all we want to do is scream and shout and stomp. Because we've seen just how powerful God is and we've also seen how gentle he is towards each one of us in Jesus. And if that's the level of gentleness and restraint God has shown to us, then at the end of the day, really, what right do we have to not be gentle with the people he places in our lives? You know, what's so cool about this is that the more gentle we are towards others, the more we live like Jesus, the more we, we build each other up in Jesus and the better we point this world right to Jesus. And so how do we do this? How do we grow in gentleness? How do we embrace this fruit that God calls us to live by? Three ways. First, we gotta start out by being gentle with ourselves. You see, we gotta remember that growing more gentle takes time. And it's also a gift. It's something that God gives us. It's not something we can just muster up on our own. And so if we're going to be more gentle towards others, we first have to learn how to be gentle towards ourselves. What does that mean? Well, it means we, while we don't excuse our sins and we don't stop trying to live better, at the same time, we also don't punish ourselves for them. Because, you know, for some of us, maybe for all of us, the meanest voice in our lives is the one right inside us, discouraging us, pointing out our failures, telling us that we don't deserve to be loved, telling us we're not making any progress. And friends, you probably don't need me to tell you this, but if that's the voice you're always hearing, it's going to be nearly impossible to be gentle with others. So we start always from a place of the gospel, remembering God's gentleness to us in Jesus. Instead of listening to that critical voice, we tell ourselves again and again and one more time still that even though we still sin against him, God has chosen once and for all to be gentle towards us. And he's promised to keep making us more and more in his image, even though it takes time. One of the best ways to keep telling ourselves this It seems simple, but it's by reading the Bible. Why? Because that's where we first heard this amazing good news. And you see, friends, when we start from that place, when we understand how gentle God is towards us, that makes it a whole lot easier to be gentle with others. And that's our next point. We're gentle with others. There's there's three ways that we can help be gentle towards others. First, we recognize our triggers. Recognize our triggers. You know, we all have different things that that tend to set us off, that raise our stress levels, right? In fact, when I take couples through premarital counseling, one of the the things we do is we talk about the triggers that each person has because they're all different, right? We try to understand what things can make us not respond in the healthiest way. And this could be certain topics, right? Things like talking about finances, kids, careers, so forth. It could also be circumstantial things, things like being tired, being hungry. Anybody ever been there before, right? Being hungry, being criticized, running late, so forth. Because you see, if we can recognize those things ahead of time, then when we're in those moments, we can better be on guard against them. Second, we see other people as people. Seems obvious, but again, Not easy to do. I don't know about you, but it's so easy to treat someone poorly if we only see them as some opponent, some enemy, someone who's wronged us or offended us. But you see, in the heat of the moment, if we can take a minute to first step back and remember that above all else, that other person is a person. Right? They're a husband or wife. They're a son or a daughter. They're a fellow believer. They're someone with their own hopes and struggles. And ultimately, there's someone who's also made in God's image. If we can remember that, it makes it so much easier to stay 
gentle because they're no longer some nameless bad guy. Now they're a person just like you, just like me. And when we do this, it helps us think about how our words and actions are going to affect them. It can even help us to see what the true cost of being heavy-handed with them is going to be. And as we are gentle with others, third, we seek to resolve our differences always with the least amount of force necessary. Because, you know, more often than not, we can disagree with someone. We can even call them to live differently, friends, without raising our voice, without taking cheap shots, without strong-arming them. In fact, at least in my own life, I found that sometimes when we feel the need to not be gentle, or in my case, the need for me to not be gentle, it's because I'm in the wrong. Because, you know, if I'm right and if the point I'm trying to make is right, then that point can stand just fine all on its own. But if I need to get all huffy and puffy about it, maybe I'm not as right as I think I am. And then lastly, and most importantly, we got to be gentle with God. What does that mean? Well, it means that we don't try to strong arm God or demand our way. It's all about surrender, surrendering ourselves completely to him. Because, you know, we can't always change the circumstances that God lets us go through in this life. We can't even claim to understand all of them. But by God's grace, we can change how we choose to respond. And so when we find ourselves tempted to not be so gentle, one of the best things we can do is pray about it. Ask God to soften our hearts. Ask God, Lord, how would you have me respond in this moment? Ask him for strength to follow his will because if God has shown us anything, he is gentle and he will help us. That's the kind of God he is. And so for each of us, as we go out from here today, let's think about who God has placed in our lives that he wants us to be more gentle toward. And also ask him for strength to daily follow his leading as he grows more and more of his gentle fruit right in us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, Lord, we just again affirm and praise you because you are not only almighty, but Lord, you are all loving and all gentle towards us. Lord, you have modeled for us what true gentleness looks like. And so, Lord, we know that, that none of us will ever be perfect in this area. And so we just ask, Lord, that you will continue by your spirit making progress in us. Build upon the gentleness that you have shown us. Help us to daily be gentle towards the people in our lives so that we may always be pointing them right to you. And Lord, we long for that day when you return and we get to experience your strength and your love and your gentleness and your glory most fully. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And Awakening began eight years ago and was the brainchild of Jim DeBoer at Hope College. Um, and over these last eight years, we've seen a couple hundred individual students from probably a dozen different states around the country. And our program continues to grow. It started with 20 students in the first year, and um, at, our, at our most, I believe we had 56 in, in one week. Um, and it was rooted in the verse from 1 Timothy 4, and it says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And so to fulfill that mission, part of what we do at Awakening is we visit a variety of different churches and see how a variety of different styles worship. So we've gone everywhere from deeply liturgical at an Anglican church to just a couple hours later at a non-denominational megachurch. And so it's a really sharp contrast, but we as Christians know that everyone worships differently. And it's so important we coach our kids about what intergenerational worship means which is that even for high schoolers to some of you celebrating your 70th wedding anniversary, we all worship differently. And um, when we spend our time analyzing worship and putting it into the two camps, if you know what I'm talking about, 
it's really distracting us from what the mission of worship is, which is laying ourselves at the feet of Jesus. And that was a hard pill for me to swallow as a high schooler when I started at Awakening six years ago. But I can confidently say that after learning that, um, Awakening thoroughly prepared me for my role here and for the work that I do here. And so I'm so grateful to Jim and um, for you supporting us coming here and for the many other ways that you can support Awakening, which you can talk to Jim or I about, but what's more important is worship. So this last song is a camp favorite of ours. Our students, every night, we don't ask them to. The interns are busy talking about logistics, and the kids take time, and they gather in the hallway in the stairwell, and it's just spontaneous worship. And um, it's something that's happened every year, unprompted, and it's one of our favorite traditions of the week. Um, so this is, a, this is one of our favorites. It's called The Blessing. Um, and this song may be new to you, um, kind of like with the song earlier. If you're not familiar with this song, please let us sing it over you. And um, as the spirit moves in your heart, feel free to join us. Um, you can remain seated for this song.
we give one more hand to our awakening? You know, friends, as a pastor, sometimes when you get up and preach, you're in a weird spot. Well, you're always in a weird spot, but sometimes you feel it more because you look at people in the congregation and they have modeled things so well for you and it makes it hard. What am I going to get up and say? <laughs> what can I teach them, right? And today, I hope you know, it was one of those days too. As a staff, um, and for me personally, we have experienced so much gentleness given everything that this congregation has gone through. And so just thank you. And, and my sending, my encouragement before I give the blessing is just keep living into that gentle nature that God first showed us in Jesus, right? Lean on him for strength as we daily do that. Now let's stand and receive his blessing. Friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you.